All right, hello anybody watching this asynchronously. This is the Bio 105 lecture for June 9th, uh, 2021. All right, um, we're going to be wrapping up our PowerPoint about macromolecules today, at least that's my goal. Then I'll be opening it up to some discussion and questions near the uh, closer to the end. All right, so recording is running, sound speeds, um, share screen. Let's get this thing going. Okay, so yesterday we got through our carbohydrate discussion. We talked about energy storage carbohydrates and we talked about structural carbohydrates, the most important ones being um, cellulose and chitin to a lesser extent. Okay. So now we're moving on to a basic discussion of lipids, which are the fats and the oils, essentially. Okay. We're going to be talking about the importance of saturated versus unsaturated fatty acids, <clears throat> which really deals with the fluidity of a solution made up of those of those fatty acids. We'll talk about triglycerides, phospholipids, a little bit about cholesterol. It'll be nice and mellow. Okay. So lipids in general, some, some of the essential purposes of lipids. The key characteristic that we're gonna be talking about is gonna come back over and over and over again. And I've mentioned before is polarity and solubility in water. We've already talked about the oil and water don't mix thing and how that's based around the polarity of water versus the non-polarity of lipids, okay? So when you see hydrophobic, that should cue you in to thinking about polarity. So hydrophobic means non-polar for our purposes. So what are some purposes of lipids? For example, we've got this otter over here that has a lot of hydrophobic lipids on its uh, fur, embedded on it or coating its fur. This allows it to float as well as to have its skin remain kind of drier and warmer, okay? Um, also, we've got lipid coverings on leaves which is very important because, well, one of the main purposes this is important is because when you've got a leaf and you have water puddling and pooling on it, there's guaranteed to be some fungi or some bacteria inside of that water. And if it sits there long enough, then eventually these things can penetrate the plant tissue and infect it. So instead, a waxy coating is used, and this means that water will not pool and will actually hopefully fall off of the leaves. Right. So that's an important purpose of lipids. So lipids are primarily nonpolar. Some lipids will have nonpolar regions and polar regions, like the phospholipids that we've talked about very briefly. Okay. And once again, we've got these lipids being used as energy storage, just like those storage carbohydrates, okay? So this is why we accumulate fat, fats, right? Um, they can be broken down later and the energy can be harvested from, their, from the bonds within the molecules, essentially, okay? Also important for insulation from the environment. We talked about the otter example also important in organisms which, uh, which have adipose tissue, which is the, the fat tissue. Adipose tissue, when it swells with oils, it insulates you, okay? So, you know, you've all seen walruses and seals that have a lot of blubber on them in order to insulate them from cold environments, okay? Keep the heat in, keep the cold from coming out, all right? Also, lipids can be a lot of these molecules can be broken down and subunits can be used to build up other molecules. And we'll talk about this when we talk about our metabolism lecture as well. But steroids, for example, here are have components that are derived from lipids. 
Now the common piece of terminology that you'll hear that relate to lipids or the, the terms that you've probably heard before, things like fats, oils, waxes, maybe not phospholipids, but you've heard of steroids, all right? All of these fall under the category of lipids, okay? And right away, that should make you think nonpolar, and that should also, after today, make you start to think about the capacity for passing across a plasma membrane. We're going to talk about plasma membranes in a second, so I'm not going to get ahead of myself because I want to have the illustration to one of the visual aid. Okay, we've talked about this enough now that this should just all be assumed, right? They're hydrophobic because they have mostly nonpolar covalent bonds present. Hydrocarbons in general form nonpolar covalent bonds, okay? Because the, you know, it's, it's like the examples that we saw before. You have carbon bound to hydrogens, right? Electrons are gonna be shared equally among those different atoms, among those different nuclei. And a similar thing happens when you have a long chain of carbons, like so. Right, you can see once again how there's no, there's not really a point here with extreme electronegativity, which would lead the electrons to spend more time in any given portion of the molecule. Now, really briefly, we need to introduce some shorthand, which you should have seen in chemistry, but if it's rusty, I want you to be comfortable with it because you'll see it in our molecular models that we're gonna be showing in a second. So right here, we've got a fully saturated hydrocarbon, okay? Remember that the carbon can form four covalent bonds, a maximum of four covalent bonds, and each one of these carbons, all four of its valence electrons, or I'd say, I should say, its valence shell has been entirely filled. Now, there's a shorthand because hydrocarbons are so present, are so uh, omnipresent in biochemistry. You use these zigzag lines, right? You may have seen this before. So we have one, two, three, four carbons here. One, two, three, four carbons. One, two, three, one, two, three, four. Perfect, okay. So this little line that you see on the right, this zigzag line, surprisingly enough, is actually equivalent to the fuller, the more complete formula that I've drawn on the left. So when you see these zigzag lines, each, um, each point here represents a carbon, okay? And if no groups are indicated, if no special functional groups are indicated, you are meant to assume that the carbon is participating in hydrogen bonds, okay? So you can see right here, four, four bonds that it can form, and because there's no special group indicated, you can assume that the additional valent, the valent shell is also filled with covalent bonds to hydrogen. Now, what you would see if that was not the case would be something like this, okay? And that indicates that this carbon right here has a hydroxyl group attached, okay? Oh, good, good, good. Um, come on, my tablet's being a little weird. You can also see things like this additional line indicates a double bond, okay? Which would be a double bond right here. And if that's the case, you're also meant to assume the structural formula changes to this, okay? Because once again, four maximum bonds. And you can see one, two, three, four, right there. Now, hopefully that was, hopefully that's review. You're gonna see, because you see right here, when you're drawing like long fatty acid chains, long hydrocarbon chains in a fatty acid, like at the top here, it'd be pretty time consuming to illustrate all that when really you could go like, you can just have a situation like this. You know, you just draw a zigzag line. It's really nice and friendly. So when you see those zigzag lines, you should know that it, it, it indicates a long hydrocarbon chain. All right, cool. 
So fatty acids, all right? They get their name fatty acids because of this carboxyl group. There's a terminal carboxyl group and then a long hydrocarbon chain here, all right? Now fatty acids can be joined together into triglycerides, which we'll see in a second. And those sort of, um, those are really the natural state that we see fats in usually. Okay, so how do fatty acids vary? They can vary in their length and they can also vary in the number and locations of double bonds. And number and locations of double bonds relate to whether it's a saturated fatty acid or an unsaturated fatty acid. And this is the same uh, terminology that applies to nutrition, right? When you eat, when you have saturated fats and unsaturated fats, it's the same phenomenon. It deals with whether or not there are double bonds in the fatty acid chain, in the hydrocarbon chain, I should say, okay? So a saturated fatty acid, you can consider it as being saturated with hydrogen, like in this example up at the top. That's a saturated fatty acid because you have the maximum number of hydrogen atoms possible. Each one of these carbons can bind to a maximum number of two hydrogens, this one to a maximum number of three. So you see how there's no, um, there's no double bond going on here. An unsaturated fatty acid would have a double bond like so potentially, Oops, that line did not draw out so well, like, like that, which means that you would have fewer hydrogens because those valence, that valence shell is being taken up with electrons from a carbon. Yeah. Question, this, that fatty acid does have a double bond with an oxygen. So to be unsaturated, does that mean it has to have a double bond between two carbon atoms? Yes, yes, essentially. That's a great way to think of it. Um, this terminology relates not to this portion of the fatty acid, but to the, the hydrocarbon chain, what you might call the hydrocarbon tail of the fatty acid. So a fatty acid by definition will have this carboxyl group. So you don't, yeah, so that's a very, very good question. Um, you would expect, so for our definition, you can absolutely consider it as an unsaturated fatty acid, has double bonds between carbons in hydrocarbon chain. Great clarification, thank you. And here we're gonna see some examples of unsaturated fatty acids. Saturated acid, fatty, so saturated fatty acids, this is a more clear definition. Hydrocarbon chains connected only by single bonds. Unsaturated fatty acids have one or more double bonds in the hydrocarbon chain. Okay. Now, we've talked very, very briefly about isomers, right? We talked about cis and trans isomers, okay? And that's gonna come back right here. So cis meaning same and trans meaning different, okay? When you have a cis fatty acid, the arrangement around the double bond will be more or less mirrored as you can see right here in this illustration. At the orientation, if you had a mirror, a plane right here, it's a mirror image on both sides. In the trans fatty acid, if you have a mirror right here, one side is flipped, okay, in orientation to the other. Look at these hydrogen atoms specifically. So the arrangement has been reversed. Now that's actually very, very important because when you have a cis fatty acid, you end up with these bends in the hydrocarbon chain. Remember that around a double bond, there is no rotation possible, okay? So this sort of um, bent conformation can't be adjusted, all right? Same with this straighter conformation down here, can't be adjusted, all right? Cool, and this is gonna be very important because a molecule with a bend in it, if you have a bunch of these, they can't be packed as tightly. Right? These linear trans fatty acids can be packed very, can be packed more tightly, more closely to what, to, in, to what we would see in a saturated fatty acid. 
Okay. We will talk more about that, so don't worry too much if that kind of zipped by too quickly. All righty, cool. So triglycerides, I told you we'd talk about them. Oops, there we go, triglycerides, all right? Triglyceride is made up of gl a glycerol molecule, which you can see over here, all right? Covalently bound to three fatty acids, which you can see right here. So this is the triglyceride. Below, right there. Okay. Now, the same, there's going to be the same amount of importance here regarding to whether or not these, um, these hydrocarbon chains are saturated versus unsaturated. It's going to be the same sort of idea that if they are cis, if they are cis double bonds present, you get a kink conformation, and that makes it more difficult to pack these things together tightly. So that's kind of the difference between something like butter, which is solid at room temperature, and something like olive oil, which is liquid at room temperature. All right. It all comes down to how tightly these things can pack together. Take a look at these space filling models right here and here. And hopefully it's semi-intuitive that you'd be able to pack a bunch of these straight, uh, straight saturated fats on top of one another, as opposed to if you had bends, you see, things would pack more loosely. That means that at a, at a given temperature, any given temperature, a saturated fat is more likely to be solid than an unsaturated fat, okay? And some of you may have, you know, put like an olive oil dip in the fridge or something and seen that yes, olive oils, these unsaturated fats can be, can be encouraged to solidify by reduced temperatures, okay? It's all about fluidity right here, okay? Great. So once again, take a look at, this is now a triglyceride. This is a triglyceride, but the principle of the cis chain leading to a bend, adjusting the shape is still the same as what we've been talking about thus far. Okay. So remember, cis means same same arrangement across a double bond. It's pretty darn clear that A is the same across the double bond, whereas B is different. Right. So the cis fatty acid here is A. And this is the one that's going to have a bend in it. Uh, I can't really illustrate that too well. Never mind. That was a bad idea to illustrate. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Okie dokie. So trans fats have been removed from a lot of foods. That was a big health thing back when I was an undergrad. Uh, because these trans fats are actually demonstrated to be uh, less healthy, they can solidify in your uh in your system, essentially, even in your circulatory system, because they are, they're easier to pack more densely, they can generate plaques and things like this. Whereas a cis fat is actually, um, it's actually pretty interesting. You can have in a vessel of some sort, a plaque begins to build up, right? And let's say that this plaque is made up primarily of saturated and trans fats. Now, a, here we go, perfect. A cis fat, well, cis fat right here. Molecule can actually come by, oops, what happened? There we go. Okay, so there's some cis fat flows by. Now, because both of these are nonpolar, they're still both nonpolar, but this, cis fat is more readily brought, is more readily liquefied and will move through your system more easily. 
it can actually encounter this plaque and dissolve a portion of it and then form a larger mass of cis and trans fats, which then can be carried off. So it's been demonstrated that cis fats could actually undo some of the damage of trans fats in the circulatory system. So this all comes down to fluidity once again. The saturated fats and the trans fats are going to be less fluid because they can be packed more densely due to their linear shape. Cool. You can kind of think about it as um, bricks versus um, stones. You can pack bricks more densely in a wall than you can pack stones, right? Bricks just sit right on top of each other. There's no interference. Whereas with stones, there's abnormal shapes and they pack less densely and you have to use some sort of material to pack in between them and all that stuff. Okay, and you can even keep that analogy going and say that a bunch of rocks that you stack up to make a wall without anything attaching them to one another is going to be more likely to crumble than if you just stack a bunch of bricks because the bricks pack more tightly together. So if that analogy helps, then it helps. And if not, then disregard it. Okay, William Norman, this fella, um, developed the technology that's used to produce things like, I can't believe it's not butter, okay? Products like that. They basically, you take some vegetable oils, which have a lot of unsaturated fats in them, right? Which are primarily unsaturated fats. Um, you bubble hydrogen through the oils and that encourages these double bonds like this one here, to be um, to become saturated, let's say. It encourages hydrogens to be attached to these carbons, then the double bond falls apart, and then you take on the saturated shape, along with all of the characteristics of saturated fats, like being solid at room temperature, okay? So that's the prime purpose of this. They bubbled hydrogen through some unsaturated fats, causing them to become saturated, also producing unsaturated fats with trans double bonds. And then primarily they made these things into thicker compounds, which are easy to transport and are also um, considered desirable by some people. It's nice to be able to spread an oil, for example. Okay. There were two issues with this, right? One, is that trans fats are unhealthy. Okay. There are some reasons for this that we don't have to really worry about, but saturated fats, as I mentioned, they pack tightly, but trans saturated fats, they also pack tightly and they are less, they're less readily broken down. They're less healthy to have in your system. Okay. The, there was an additional problem with this technology of hydrogenating vegetable oils, and that's how they bubbled hydrogen through the saturated fats. Classic techniques involved like, things like nickel hydride, and then you ended up with contamination of the oils, making them even more unhealthy. Modern technology for hydrogenating vegetable oils doesn't really result in, in that, but it does still, it can still generate trans fats, which are unhealthy. Okay, cool. Does that second from the bottom, does that mean that a zero grams trans fat label actually means that there are 0.5 grams of trans fats in there? That is what that means. Wow. Just like with any nutritional label, there's always a sort of a, oops, <laughs> a range that's considered uh, acceptable. Um, you, yeah, you, you have a, like a margin of error that's acceptable. So if it's within 0.5 grams per serving, you can list it as zero grams. Um, fun example of that is there was a, there was a beer they had up back home at the, for a while there where they were advertising that it had 6.66% alcohol. There's a cute thing. So they could do that because there's a margin of error of about, I think 0.1 to 0.2%. So they could list it as long as it was within 0.2% of that, they could list it as whatever they wanted. 
So that's just a fun little tidbit there. And so, yeah, because of the health hazards of trans fats, there's a lot of, there's been a lot of effort to just get it out of the food supply. This is getting back to what we talked about before with fluidity and the terminology and the measurement of a melting point. Melting point just tells you the temperature at which something transitions from a solid to a liquid, okay? So this trans fat here, elatic acid on the right, you can see the double bond is there. And you can see the orientation of these hydrogen atoms is opposite, okay? Or I should say hydrogen nuclei, I suppose, okay? Trans fat right there has a much higher melting point, okay? Now this oleic acid, double bond here, cis fatty acid, okay? This thing has a much lower melting point. And once again, it's all about how easily these things can be densely packed. When something's in a liquid form, all the molecules are moving around one another, right? So if you have all these oddly shaped uh, trans fats, like so, you can see how this thing's spinning around and rotating with a bunch of other molecules with that shape, with unique shapes sometimes, or with shapes like this maybe two double bonds there, all right? This would be much more difficult to pack tightly. Hopefully I'm not over, hopefully I'm not covering this too much. It's kind of the, one of the key things though going on here. Okay, cool. So you probably heard of omega fatty acids, especially if you, you know, purchase fish and stuff. They're always uh, bragging about how many omega fatty acids it's got. You got to get your omega threes, you know, and uh, there's a reason for that. Okay. Omega just means that the number that follows is going to indicate the position of the double bond from what's termed the omega end of the molecule. You don't need to worry too much about that. More so, I'd like you to just know that these omega three and omega sixes these are essential fatty acids, essential for brain development, blood pressure regulation, immune system function, as you can see on the third bullet point here. But they are not natively produced in mammals, so they must be consumed. Okay. It's just like, uh, just like the definition of a vitamin, right? Vitamins are things that you don't produce inside your body, but you need them for regular function. So you don't consider these fatty acids vitamins, but they are, their definition is very, very similar. Okay, cool. Perfect, 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 perfect. Uh, yeah, so this is just some information showing that, yeah, these things are, these things are, um, these have been implicated in a number of, disorders. So deficiencies in these omega fatty acids have been indicated in a bunch of disorders. Okay, cool. So here's our omega end. If you're interested, it's the opposite end from the uh, carboxyl group. Okay. So it's like the end of the tail, the end, the omega end, the end end, right? And then you're just counting the carbons away. So one, two, three, That'd be an omega-3. These are all omega-3, as you can see. One, two, three. Right there. All right. Cool. Great. Uh, and then same thing, omega-6, go to the end end and count the number of carbons before the first double bond. Cool. Okay, so we've got here a molecule with the formula C18H36O2. So you're probably picking up on a couple of things. 36 is two times 18, all right? We know that one of these is going to have a 
carboxyl group on one end. So that's going to account for our two oxygens. All right. And then the hydrogen number should be twice the number of carbons. Let's go ahead and do a quick example here. But it may not be exactly double, depending on if there are saturated versus unsaturated double bonds. So in this example, we have three carbons and one, two, three, four, five, six hydrogens in this unsaturated fatty acid. It's just a, it's just a abbreviated so I can show you the relationship between the two. All right. So this formula is probably going to be a fatty acid. And in fact, we could intuit that it was probably a saturated fatty acid. Because if you had a double bond, you would have fewer than twice the number of carbons. For your hydrogen number would be fewer than twice the number of carbons. All right. Cool. So the key clue there is the HO at the left end, that hydroxyl group. It's I would I would say that the key is really the whole carboxyl group. Because that also accounts for another oxygen here. When you are when you're when you encounter questions like this, what they really want you to get at is the relative number of each element, if that makes sense. Like remember, we talked about C N H two O N for the carbohydrates. So if you can you can actually just draw out a hypothetical fatty acid like I did here and then look at that relationship and see that, okay, if I'm looking at this right here, then I expect an, a formula, something like uh, C, uh, ugh, it's kind of tricky because we have those two oxygens instead of four here. But we're going to expect something like CNH2N. Um, and then O is going to be two because we only have that one carbo carboxyl end. OK. And once you have an equation like this figured out from your generalized formula above, it's simple enough to vet the next formula and see if it's true or nearly true they could trick you up by putting like H34, but you would know that, oh, that just means there's a double bond here, reducing that number. I don't have a lot of questions like this on any exams or anything, but um, it's mainly just like, a, it's a critical thinking exercise primarily. I don't know why I'm erasing everything. It all disappears when I hit the next button. <laughs> okay. So cool. if there was a double bond, wouldn't it still be a fatty acid? Yeah, it would still be a fatty acid, yes. Oh. But uh, yeah, so you got to be kind of prepared for situations like that. It, it really could occur that this says, you know, like this is 32, for example, if there were two double bonds in the fatty acid chain. Mm -hmm. But things like this is almost like seeing things like, okay, there's two oxygens. Okay, that fits in with what I would expect from a fatty acid. And there are nearly twice as many hydrogens that also fits in. Yeah. Okay. It's tricky, don't get me wrong. But um, the carbohydrates and the fatty acids are probably the easiest to confuse, except that there will be a lot more oxygen in a carbohydrate. It'd be a lot closer to the number of carbons. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. So now we get into the fun stuff with lipids, which are the phospholipids. These are amphipathic molecules. If you remember, I mentioned that a few times ago. That just means a molecule with a region of polarity and a region of non-polarity. So if you take a look here, We've got nonpolar hydrocarbon chain or fatty acid chain, right? Then we have a polar group. Uh, the most important component of which is the phosphate group. And that's what we call it a phospholipid. 
the phosphate group has a lot of oxygens in it. It has a partial negative charge. It's highly polar. So it means that we've got what we would term a polar head or a hydrophilic head, and then a non, the nonpolar tails or hydrophobic tails. So if we take a look here, this is actually similar to a triglyceride. We've got the glycerol molecule here, which could theoretically participate in a bond with another fatty acid chain. And now you see why I was trying to get you used to that shorthand of these zigzag lines, because there they are being used already. Okay, Theoretically, there could be another fatty acid chain attached to this glycerol group. However, there is instead a phosphate group and a choline group. We don't need to worry as much about that. Okay. So once again, fatty acid tails are hydrophobic. Phosphate group and the attachment groups are hydrophilic. Nonpolar. Polar. Remember, like dissolves like, and water is a polar molecule. Oh, so yeah, these things can be, these things are often drawn like this. You'll see me drawing them a lot that way, where I'd, I'll just draw a circle and then two lines coming off of it like this. And you can see what that represents, hopefully, the phospholipid, the phosphate, the hydrophilic head and the hydrophobic tails. Okay, cool. And we get, to talk, we get to talk a lot more. I really like talking about the plasma membranes um, and all that. They're really, really important. And they're really based around these phospholipid structures. They're called phospholipid bilayers. I will take a second out after the next slide to introduce that concept. But we do have a more thorough discussion when we talk about um, our cell structure and function PowerPoint, which is our next PowerPoint. But I've always been taught that repetition is the key in courses like this, so I'm going to repeat myself sometimes. Okay, great. So steroids. Steroids are specific types of lipids, okay? They have a lot of, they're a long hydrocarbon chain, all right, that's been now, that is now taking on a ring conformation. Okay, cholesterol is a type of steroid. It is a component in animal cell membranes. Now, these are lipids, and that means that they are going to be hydrophobic, right? And it's a little more difficult to see when you have these rings, but just take a look here and note that there's really no place that the electrons would want to spend extra time, except maybe around this hydroxyl group. And that's not enough to really um, to really give the molecule, the macromolecule, a high enough degree of polarity to make it soluble in water. Okay. So there's steroid down here. And so these are both steroids, cholesterol and cortisol. And I'm going to talk about cholesterol just briefly. Well, oh, right now, actually, and its role in the phospholipid bilayer. Okay. Cell membranes. You've got them, bacteria have got them, um, plants have got them, all right? Fungi have got them. Everything's got cell membranes. They are essential for, main, for maintaining a barrier between the internal environment of the cell and the external environment. And that's really the basis of life is maintaining different conditions than your external environment. So let's see here. We've got a cell. Okay, right? And there needs to be regulation of what comes in and what goes out. This is accomplished via the structure of the plasma membrane, which looks like this. And bear with me, I've, I've gotten better at drawing this quickly, but you know, here we go. Okay, so all of these are phospholipids. This is termed the phospholipid bilayer because there are two layers of phospholipids. If you dump a bunch of phospholipids into an aqueous solution, they will actually auto-assemble into phospholipid bilayers. That's because 
all of these hydrophobic tails are being repelled by water molecules. And all of these hydrophilic heads are being attracted to water molecules. Eventually, the hydrophobic tails sort of align and group themselves. And this forms what we would call a domain of hydrophobicity. All right. Now, what that means is that only certain things can actually move across that membrane. Anything that's hydrophilic or highly polar will not easily cross this membrane, okay? Because it has to enter this hydrophobic domain, which will be repelling any molecules that are attempting to cross. There are a lot of ways that the cell accomplishes moving things across this domain of hydrophobicity. And we'll talk about a lot of them. Primarily it's accomplished through specialized proteins which are embedded in the membrane and allow for transport or passage. Okay. Now it's one last really cool thing here about, the, about cholesterol and its essential purpose. These plasma membranes, they can be destabilized via high temperatures, okay? High temperature, remember, just affects movement of molecules. So it's kinetic motion of these, of these phospholipids. And when they start to wiggle around too much, they can break apart. And then the membrane falls apart. And technically it might auto assemble later, but it's not going to do so in such a way that it um, restores the cell. Now the cholesterol can actually be interposed between those um, intercalated between those phospholipids and can absorb some energy when they start to jiggle around and it helps to stabilize the plasma membrane. That's one key purpose of cholesterols. I have additional slides about this in some PowerPoint that we will talk about. It's in the cell structure and function PowerPoint. So it's just something that I wanted to mention. And remember, because these are lipids, they can be dissolved in the domain of hydrophobicity in the nonpolar area inside of here. Okay, try to get too far ahead of myself. Now we're going to move on. Let's see where our time is at. Wow, time freaking flies, I swear, in these lectures. Uh, last time it worked pretty well to do about an hour and 20 and then take a break and then come back. So let's, uh, let's rock that again, unless somebody needs a, desperately needs a break. Okay, cool. All righty, uh, proteins now. Okay, oh, oh, I'm so sorry. I forgot to mention something. We've been talking about monomers versus polymers, right? We talked about monosaccharides versus polysaccharides, and how these monomers are these repeating subunits that are joined together to make a larger polymer. You do not consider fats and oils a polymer um, because if you look right here, there's no repeating monomer that's being attached. You have these hydrocarbon tails that are attached to, or fatty acid tails that are attached to a glycerol molecule. There's, it doesn't have this sort of like monomer, 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 monomer uh, shape. And that'll make sense as we talk about the amino acids, which clearly do have when you gen when you generate a um, uh, when you generate a protein, they clearly do have this monomer, monomer, monomer arrangement. Okay, uh, so remember, in the see, it's very clear in this image the monomers right here forming the polymer. Okay. It's not as apparent in these illustrations here. Okay. So what is important about this? Why, why do you mention? Like, how would you word it? Sorry. No problem. No problem. I would say that um, fats technically, um, technically do not qualify as polymers because there's no repeating molecule. There's no repeating monomer. Um, this, the chains of carbon and hydrogen, these aren't considered as um, sub as repeating subunits. It's a it's a bit of an abstract concept. I don't believe I have a necessarily have like a test question on it, but I just want to clarify that that's um, 
a difference in the structure here, which as I said, will make more sense when I talk about um, the amino acids. Basically, it's so that you'll know that what are the, what's the monomer of a, fa of a fatty acid? There's oh. not a monomer. It's, it is the fatty acid. Yeah, question, sorry. Uh, okay, no, thank you. I was gonna say thank you. <laughs> oh, no problem. Yeah, awesome, I'm happy that clarified. Yeah, you're gonna see when you talk about these amino acids, it's clearly repeating subunits that have slight modifications. Yeah. Okay, cool. So let's go ahead and look at some proteins. Proteins form the majority of dry weight of cells. Okay. This led early scientists to propose proteins as the um, mechanism of inheritance, of genetic inheritance, rather than DNA, because there's so much protein and there are so many different types of amino acids as opposed to only four different types of nucleotides in DNA, okay? Um, yeah, but we will get to that later. Don't let that mess you up here. So this is kind of a preview slide. We will be going into genetics a lot. This phenomenon or this process is often termed the central dogma. So a dogma is something that's fiercely adhered to, widely believed, not really questioned, right? Central dogma of biology is that Genes encoded on DNA or sequences encoded on DNA are transcribed into mRNA and then translated into proteins. For now, the key part that we need to, that we need to understand is that the nucleotide sequences on DNA are going to encode for the amino acid sequences of proteins. And this is what really leads to all the variety that we see in life. All living organisms utilize DNA, right? As their template, as their instruction manual for generating the organism's uh, structure, okay? Now, different DNA sequences lead to the production of different amino acid chains. These different amino acid chains, okay, these lead to different proteins, and that leads to all the different larger structures that you see in an organism. Okay. And a lot of this is mediated because enzymes are encoded in this way. Enzymes are proteins, and those determine which chemical reactions occur in a given organism. We'll talk about that more, though, so I don't want to, um, I don't want to screw anybody up. Okay. Oh, um, I always do a plug for a, a book, a very approachable book that will give you all the genetics background you need for this course. I'm going to put it up really quickly here. Uh, a lot of students have downloaded, the, have purchased this and read it. It's not very expensive online. It is a sort of a, like a graphic novel that explains that explains basic genetics. I usually have a copy in my office, but it's at home right now. So it's a very fun, a very nice book. It's easy, an easy read. It's got like a little story to it about these aliens that reproduce clonally, and then they have to figure out why they're all getting sick. And so this just, it's, it's very digestible. It's written by a scientist. It has a lot of um, good information. The Stuff of Life by Mark Schultz. Highly recommended. Um, you can read it in like a couple sittings and it'll make all this stuff seem much more clear, honest. Okay. In fact, I've toyed with the idea of having that be um, a requ the required text for this course <laughs> or one of them, but uh, I've never pulled the trigger on that. Okay. Proteins. We're still talking about them. Let's see here types of proteins and what they do. Enzymatic proteins, we're going to talk about enzymes a lot in this course. Enzymes, as I mentioned before, they accelerate chemical reactions, okay? So an example right here is digestive enzymes, 
help cat help catalyze the hydrolysis of bonds in food molecules. When this bond is broken, energy is released. Okay, and we can harvest that energy. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, yeah. Enzymes are very important, but I'll try not to get too caught up in them right now while we're still talking about other stuff. All right, next, let's go ahead and talk about storage proteins. Okay. So I've already mentioned that the majority of an organism's dry tissue weight is made up of proteins. And the building block of a protein is amino acid. Or, or the building blocks of proteins are amino acids, okay? So a storage protein is useful because it can store a bunch of amino acids. This is so the best example here is probably in an egg because there's no additional intake of nutrients or of amino acids or of other proteins by the egg. Okay, the egg is there, and then the embryo is going to begin development. So there's a specialized protein called ovalbumin, which is present in egg whites. It can be broken down and free up all these individual amino acids, which then can be combined to form the new proteins required for the developing embryo. I've also got, you know, milk protein right here, protein of milk. It's also considered a storage protein holds a bunch of amino acids, which the developing organism can then use to build up tissues. I see a question in the chat. Give me two shakes, I'll figure that out. Do storage proteins and specialized amino cells. Um, so the aminos aren't cells, they're just molecules. All right. Um, no, yeah, no, no, no problem. That is so wrong. <laughs> Thank you. That is so wrong. No, not a problem at all. Not a problem at all. A storage protein is usually, it's like a, it's got a specific balance of amino acids. So it's going to have the amino acids which are necessary for the embryo to develop. Whereas other proteins, right, are th their composition is designed around a different structure or a different function. For example, we've got these enzymatic proteins. Their amino acid sequence is, is the way it is because that allows them to catalyze chemical reactions as opposed to a storage protein, which its complement of amino acids is there because it represents what the developing organism is most likely to need. Does that help? Yeah, yeah, I guess. Yeah, thank you so much. I guess, yeah. Of course. I, I kind of had one more question really quick. So, That's and good. all of these proteins, like the different types are due to the, what you said before, the, the DNA encodes for them differently, right? Therefore, they're different fun functions. Uh, yes, yep. All these different, all these different protein types are encoded in DNA and all of their structure and function is going to depend on what amino acid sequence they have. And I've got a slide coming up that should illustrate that pretty well. Thank you. Anytime. That's, it's literally my job to answer questions, you know, <laughs> so don't be shy. <laughs> cool. Um, so we've talked about our enzymatic and storage proteins. We've also got defensive proteins. Okay. So antibodies are proteins, antibodies in your system, okay, which can help to prevent infections, can help your body to detect and target invading viruses and bacteria. We have a section on, on uh, immunities later on in the, in the course. And then one of the one of the types of proteins that we'll talk about the most in this class is the are the or are the transport proteins. And transport proteins, this gets back to what I was talking to you about with the phospholipid bilayer. Take a look right here at this illustration. So so these little blue particles right here, we're assuming that they are polar or very large or otherwise cannot cross the region of hydrophobicity, making up the phospholipid bilayer. Now a transport protein could actually be embedded in the 
plasma membrane span the distance, span the whole region of the plasma membrane and create a channel through which the molecule could be passed. Okay. Cool. So for this example, we've got hemoglobin. Okay. Let me see right here. Boom, boom, boom. And this is not, this is not the example that you see illustrated here. Hemoglobin is more of a transport protein throughout the organism, okay? So this special protein can absorb oxygen and then move it between regions of your body, which is different from proteins that transport molecules across membranes. So that's kind of two classes of transport proteins that you could think about. But we're gonna talk a lot about transport proteins. And there are when more. you say it, it helps it across the membrane, um, and then we say through the hydrophobic zone or layer, or what do we say through the hydrophobic area? I I I always say domain, but any but any piece of terminology is going to work for that. You could say the region of hydrophobicity, the um, the hydrophobic portion of the membrane, whatever you'd like. Yeah. Can I ask a question about defensive proteins? Yes. So the way the Moderna and Pfizer vaccine works is it that it introduces mRNA that is not in our system and that that mRNA stimulates the um, development of a protein that is an effective antibody against the virus? Yes, that's a very succinct explanation. So take a look back at our central dogma, right? Essentially what you're doing is you're bypassing this phase of DNA. DNA is not involved. You just put the mRNA into the organism and its machinery will produce a protein out of that. Right, and we, we couldn't produce that mRNA because it's a novel virus, correct? Exactly, exactly. Um, Theoretically, eventually someone may evolve or develop an immunity where they start to produce antibodies to that, but we're getting ahead of the curve in designing the antibody and then it's actually really, really amazing. And then going one step, so you design the antibody, which is the protein, and then you go one step back and say, okay, well then what's the sequence of mRNA we need to encode these specific amino acids? And then you're making the, the, the organism produce those antibodies um, instead of trying to inject a ton of those into the organism. Okay, that really explains why they said they, they had the architecture for the vaccine at the very beginning of the pandemic. Um, and that's because they, they, knew, they knew that mRNA sequence, I guess. Yes, or, or, or they knew the, or they knew the comp, the, you could do computer modeling of surface proteins, right? Like the spike proteins you always see on the coronavirus images. Um, you can do computer modeling of that and then see what the complementary antibody would be. And that's not the trickiest part. That's a, that could be accomplished relative, at, you know, with relative ease. And of course, it's building on hundreds of years of research and the work of a lot of very, very smart people. Um, but then once you have that polypeptide sequence, it's like, what do you do? Do you just produce a bunch of antibodies and inject them into people? That doesn't really work as well. So they just, they just went one step back and said, what instructions would encode these antibody proteins? It's really cool stuff. Yeah, thanks. Of course, of course. And I am no epidemiologist. I am not an expert in the field. So, um, but, you know, it's, it's interesting. We can all accept that it is pretty darn fascinating. Okay, cool. Let's see here. Additional types of proteins that we're gonna be talking about. I'm gonna breeze through these a little more quickly. Oops, get rid of this. We've got hormonal proteins, okay? Proteins that act as hormones, okay? These basically sort of work like, um, well, they work like signaling molecules. They work to regulate gene expression, really, or to regulate other functions within the organism, 
Okay. So you know about some hormones, right? Like the sex hormones that lead to, you know, different physical expressions, um, different, different phenotypes, right? A lot of these things work by actually regulating gene expression, turning gene expression on or off. We've also got things like insulin, okay? Insulin's a protein. It's secreted by the pancreas. It moves through the bloodstream. And when it reaches, um, as it passes by tissues and interacts with tissues, it causes them to take up glucose, okay? then low levels of insulin and you can um, start to release glycogen and things like that, okay? Um, interestingly enough, because this is a protein, all right, that means that it uses the same basic building blocks that all cells use, okay? So most insulin right now is actually produced in E. coli, that's because you can just insert the genetic sequence that encodes the polypeptide sequence into those organisms and they will produce the protein, all right? Because all these organisms are using the same nucleotides and the same amino acids for building blocks. It's really cool stuff. Um, let's see. There are also receptor proteins, which we will talk about a lot later. And really what these deal with is signal transduction. So they take a signal that originates outside of the cell and elicit a response inside of the cell. And don't worry, I've got like a whole presentation about that. Then we've got a couple of protein types that you're probably very familiar with, okay? Contractile and motor proteins is like muscle tissue. All right. You know about how like all these you have all these anchor points on your skeletal system. And then when muscles contract, they lead to movements. OK, now these are these these contractile and motor proteins. Basically, what they do is they shorten. OK, so you can imagine right here. This come on now. This myosin, it has all these little attachment points. If all of these attachment points move inward, like so, then the actin filaments are going to also move inward. And this leads to an overall shortening of the fiber, which causes something to contract. And that's how most muscular movement uh, accomplishes its tasks. Okay. Cool. Um, we'll talk. We'll we'll talk a little bit more about that at some point. Then we have structural proteins, just like the freaking uh, structural carbohydrates, right? They're primarily going to be functioning in supporting structures. So some proteins. We've got keratin. Okay, hair, horns, feathers, all made up of keratin. Uh, silk fibers are proteins. They're used to make cocoons and webs. Okay, uh, collagen's a protein. You got a lot of collagen in your body, you know, soft tissues, like your earlobes and stuff like that. And then there's something called elastin, which sort of makes the framework for other, uh, for other tissues. Right. We're not gonna talk a ton about structural proteins, but this, all of these, these two slides should indicate to you that proteins are really the most, if it wasn't for the fact that proteins needed to be created, proteins would be the most important thing in an organism because they, they really come down to determining the functions. DNA just encodes which proteins you're gonna have. And of course, this is all over, so overly simplified, but we'll get more complex the further we get through the course. Okay, amino acids. These are true monomers. Are amino acids proteins? A chain of amino acids is a protein. Chain of AAs equals protein or a polypeptide. And you'll see where that name comes from in just a second. So 
here's another bit of chemistry shorthand, which I'm, I'm hoping that you all have seen before, but I'm happy to briefly refresh, okay? So amino acids have a sort of generalized structure that repeats. And that is this amino group and this carboxyl group attached to a central carbon, okay? So that's gonna be consistent in, um, let's see, true for all AAs. It's gonna be consistent between all the amino acids. Right? What's going to differ is this R group, which is sort of a generalized abbreviation for something that will differ between <laughs> different classes of this molecule. It's a very abstract statement, I know, but it's really the clearest way I can put it. Let me show you an example. So take a look here. You've got that repeating, repeating um, amino group, carboxyl group attached to a central carbon that's present in all of these different amino acids. See how that purple portion is identical between any of these amino acids. But attached to that central carbon, there's also this R group, which we would call our side chain. And that's what differs between the different amino acids. And that's what's going to lead them to having different functions. OK, so we've got, for example, nonpolar side chains, which will create hydrophobic domains in the protein. We've got polar side chains, which will produce hydrophilic domains in the proteins. Then we have electrically charged side chains, which this charge can bind certain things. It can facilitate certain reactions. It can create, you can have a, so you have a massive protein made up of hundreds of these amino acids, right? You can have domains that are like nonpolar. And then some domains which are polar. Oops. Some domains which are polar. And then some domains which are basic. All right. And all of these regions of the protein can be involved in different portions of the protein's function. And that's all determined by which types of amino acids make up that domain. Okay, so here we just got slides that zoom in on all of these. It's not essential that you memorize any of these. You should be able to recognize the backbone portion of these amino acids. But now let's look at how these are joined into a chain. Okay, this is why this is called a polypeptide because there are many poly, right, peptide bonds. And see how, the, how this is actually more like a monomer. Each of these amino acids is, a, is similar to one another and they are joined in this long repeating chain, okay? So you have this repeating backbone and you'll see the backbone terminology arise again with these side chains that actually bestow the function of the protein. And remember, these are very large, long molecules, okay? So the sequence and type of amino acid is going to determine a protein's 3D structure. Structure determines function. I've already talked about this, right? Form, oops, form equals function. Okay. And later when we talk about denaturation, it's going to become very important that if a protein's shape or structure is disrupted by something, it's going to affect how well it can function. So a functional protein is going to consist of one or more polypeptides in a unique shape. Okay. So that's gonna be clear as we look at this, perfect. The different levels of protein structure. So primary structure, as you can see right here, that's just the unique sequence of amino acids, okay? So each one of these little blue circles indicates an amino acid, okay? Cool. Now, 
interactions between the backbone, this portion here, these lead to what we would call secondary structure, primarily pleated sheets and alpha helices, helices, I'm sorry. Interactions between the backbone, you get hydrogen bonds forming, and this causes some shape to begin arising, some fun some form to begin arising in the polypeptide chain or string. Right. Then there is interaction between the side chains or the R groups. Okay. For example, a bunch of hydrophobic side groups interacting with one another because they're being repelled by surrounding water molecules, which is an example right there. Okay. Or positively charged and negatively charged side groups interacting with one another because of the separation of charge. Okay. This leads to the real the degree of form which actually begins to give your protein a function. Okay, so it's three-dimensional folding structure of the protein. Then finally, we have the quaternary structure. And these are all abbreviated like so, primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary. Okay, and this is when multiple polypeptide chains join together you can see two here, indicated by the different shades of blue. They join together and they make a larger structure, all right? A big old protein comprised of multiple polypeptides. All right, here we go, cool. We're gonna review the primary structure once again, but personally, I need a quick break, get a glass of water and all that stuff. And it's about 1217. So let's get back here at 1227, please. 10 minute break. I'm gonna pause the recording and I will see you all. Recording is resumed. All right, everybody, uh, welcome back. Let's get into this thing. <laughs> Okay, so now we're gonna see a couple of other slides that more clearly, hopefully, hopefully more clearly illustrate primary versus secondary tertiary quaternary structure. Okay, so primary structure, right? It's going to be all of the diff all these different amino acids have specific names like glycine, proline, I think it's thymine, thymine, anyways, or thyridamine. You don't have to know all the amino acids for this class, but that specific sequence of each amino acid, that's going to represent the primary structure. Secondary structure, as I mentioned before, it's due to hydrogen bonding between the backbone, the repeated amino and carboxyl end of this thing. Okay, pretty good. These hydrogen bonds are gonna lead to helix, helices and pleated sheets as our main secondary structure. There's a 3D model of an alpha helix. Let me make it play again, right there. The backbone is green and the uh, side chains are all the things interior there. Now, how do I get this to switch back? Ah. Okay, ah, there we go. It's kind of working, got through it. So spider silk, all right, comprised of proteins, all right. You get these, you get a lot of these pleated sheets in spider silk, okay? And you can imagine these pleated sheets as sort of like an accordion, right? So this accordion, you can compact it and stretch it, and this leads to a uh, stretchy sort of protein. Okay. This slide is mainly included because I like to bring up the microstructure versus macrostructure sort of discussion, because the molecules themselves or the, the polypeptides themselves are stretchy, the overall 
larger structure of the silk is also stretchy. And this adds durability, okay? Once again, all these different amino acids are shown. So now we've got tertiary structure. And you can see these side chains, these specialized side chains are now interacting with one another. So this would be an R group. This would be an R group right here. These would both be R groups, all right? And we've got, for example, hydrogen bond occurring here between two side chains. And on the right, we've got what I was talking about before, a region of hydrophobicity being created. Hydrophobic side chains are gonna want to group together. There can also be disulfide bridges, which we won't talk about really. And there can also be ionic bonds between the side chains, like an electron could be stripped off of here, leading to a partially negative charge and a, and a, and a positive charge. And then the interaction of charges can stabilize sort of a bond between those side chains. Okay. So here's a model of human growth hormone. It's a protein. All right. And this one has, as you can see in this image, this has the, of course, primary structure of amino acid sequences and the secondary structure of this alpha helix, alpha helices that are occurring, right? And then in the model on the left side, you can see indication of some side chain interactions right here. And that's enough to give human growth hormone its structure. So this only goes up to tertiary structure. Quaternary structure would involve multiple polypeptide chains that themselves have their own primary, secondary, and tertiary structure. And then those two polypeptides or more polypeptides are going to interact with one another. Okay. Cool. Fantastic. So here we've got a few examples. We've got collagen on the top right, which is basically forming like a steel cable sort of structure, right? You got one, two, three polypeptides that are all interacting and binding with one another. You've also got the example of hemoglobin in the lower right, formed of an alpha and beta subunit. Okay, which, or I should say multiple alpha and beta subunits, which then associate with one another. And these also associate with some other proteins. Okay, so these heme groups that have iron in them and which are actually responsible for binding oxygen. Okay. So multiple polypeptides all grouped together into quaternary structure. Now let's take a quick look at how primary structure influences quaternary structure. Well, it influences secondary through quaternary structure, okay? So normal hemoglobin, all right? Alpha and beta subunits, two of each, all right? They're responsible for carrying oxygen. So here's our primary structure right here. Structure of amino acid or sequence of amino acids, all right? Here's a mutated structure, a difference in one of the sequences of the amino acids, or a difference in sequence of amino acids. Um, one of these is, is switching out. You got a glutamine being replaced by a valine, I think is what it is, all right? And this leads to a different secondary and tertiary structure resulting in this exposed hydrophobic region in the sickle cell um, phenotype. Right? Then when these different polypeptides associate, we've got these beta subunits, all right, that have these exposed hydrophobic domains. And that means there can be an interaction between the hydrophobic domains, as you can see right here. So the hydrophobic domains are sort of joining up and then the molecules crystallize. And that's not what you want. That's not an ideal situation um, right here, okay? And this is called sickle cell anemia. 
the condition and it was called sickle cell hemoglobin because the hemoglobin protein, all right, it actually is shaped like a sickle, okay? So you're more likely to have blood clots as the hemoglobin crystallizes in your circulatory system and you're less likely to, you are not usually able to provide all the oxygen that your body needs because these molecules don't carry oxygen as well. Right. Now there's, we'll talk about this later when we talk about uh, evolution and genetics, okay? But you probably are aware of the benefit of sickle cell hemoglobins, which is that it is more difficult for malaria to, or the causal agent of malaria, the disorder, right? To get into these cells, okay? So this causes negatives, but it also um, reduces malaria. So that's an interesting sort of mutation that could happen, right? So imagine just taking this one step back, a mutation in genetic code can lead to a different sequence of amino acids, leading to different secondary and tertiary structures and quaternary structures. And then because form has changed, function has changed as well. But this mutation, which would normally be considered negative, does have positive benefits in reducing malaria, okay? And so in areas where malaria is very, very prevalent, individuals with the sickle cell hemoglobin can actually be more successful. And you see higher incidences of sickle cell anemia in those regions. Don't worry, we'll talk about it. I, I have a couple questions. Yeah. Okay, so first of all, does hemoglobin mean red blood cells? Um, no, hemoglobin is the specific protein that's responsible for carrying the oxygen in a red blood cell. Is responsible for carrying the oxygen in a red blood cell? Yes. Okay, um, so is hemoglobin like the carrier of a red blood cell? Yeah, I'd call it the oxygen carrier of the red blood cell, absolutely. Okay. And uh, back on the slide with the quaternary structure, if, yeah. uh, I was just curious because like I know a lot of people who like consume collagen and like think it like helps their body, but like what really does it do if you like consume collagen? Like it doesn't really replace or like replenish, right? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, So if you're, if you're consuming something, right? If, if, so let's say, let's say you want more muscles. So you eat a bunch of muscles, right? Like okay. you eat a bunch of like steak, you know, muscle tissue. Uh -huh. The muscle tissue isn't directly, it's not, its structure isn't preserved. So it's not directly incorporated into your body as muscle tissue, but it is broken down into the amino acids that are required to develop muscle tissue. Mm -hmm. So same thing with collagen. Collagen is going to break down in your digestive tract, but it's going to release a, a healthy complement of amino acids that your body is going to be in the right ratios for your body to produce collagen. It's also going to be just, just a bunch of readily available amino acids. Now, I, am, I do not know a ton about how that can, about the benefits of collagen ingestion, you know? I mean, I make smoothies now and then and my stuff, uh, my, my like protein powder stuff has collagen in it. Um, I just wanted to know like how effective it was to like actually consume things that are like supposed to like be these building blocks inside of your like naturally occurring body. It's like if I were to like consume hemoglobin, like um, we obviously know like transfusions and it replaces like uh, what your body needs, but like how ready would your body be willing to be uh, to use like the amino acids that are readily available by like consuming collagen? And like, how would your body like adapt to that? And like, what is the ratio that's like actually wasted? You know what I mean? Like, is it actually beneficial to like consume things that um, like that? Well, it with, with the specifics around collagen, I'm not sure about like how much of it's incorporated and all that, but I will say that it is essential that you take in 
all the amino acids that you need. Your body will readily use the breakdown products of proteins to build other proteins up. But anything that you died that you ingest and digest, it's not incorporated in the same form you brought it in. It's broken down into like building blocks and then you build other things up. Mm-hmm. So for example, you know, like a, like a sugar, okay? A sugar can be, sugars, lipids, all of these things can be broken down into their subunits and then used to build the other classes of molecules up. We, we have a flow chart of that at some point. I think it's in our metabolism lecture here showing the flow through of all the things that you consume and kind of where they, uh, where they go, where they're incorporated into generating energy and when they where they're incorporated into building blocks of other things. So mainly collagen, my understanding is taking it in is a way to get readily available amino acids. Okay, where can I find that flow chart? Oh, I'm not sure exactly which, uh, which PowerPoint it's in. I'm sorry. Oh, it's okay. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. It's because like when I like Google it, um, it's just like people like trying to sell me some collagen. For sure. <laughs> so I'm just confused. Yeah, absolutely. And th- this it's a good this is a good uh, place to use um, Google Scholar because if you use Google Scholar, they have to disclose any conflicts of interest or anything like that. So if they were funded by a company that produces collagen products they would have to say that. And usually that wouldn't be accepted as a primary research article. So if you drop, if you hop on scholar.google.com and just search for collagen supplement or like collagen, uh, collagen as a, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, I don't know, collagen, nutrition, things like that. You'll probably find a number of articles pretty quickly that talk about how it's used. All right, I'll send you what I find. Okay, yeah, heck, if we have a few extra minutes, we can even take a quick, we can even do a quick survey of the, of the literature, I mean, not of students. <laughs> okay, so now we need to talk about denaturation. Excuse me. Denaturation in general, right? It's when a protein loses its structure, what we call losing, losing its native state. All right, so you can lose quaternary, tertiary, and secondary structure. That's going to change the form of the protein, and that is therefore going to change the function of the protein, okay? You can have primary structure be disrupted, like this thing could actually break apart, right? And then the protein really can't be recovered. However, if primary structure is not disrupted, then you can theoretically go from denaturation to renaturation. I should have underlined that, renaturation right here. Okay, because you still have the primary structure, the same side chains are present, the same interactions between the backbone are likely, et cetera, et cetera. So you've got your normal protein structure, all right, and one of the forces that leads to denaturation can cause that to be disrupted, right? And as I said, it's going to be associated with loss of biological activity. So a few things that are common, uh, that commonly affect or commonly lead to protein denaturation, and we do have a lab entirely about this. Uh, A few things that affect are pH, temperature, ionic strength, and solubility, okay? So you can imagine, let's start with pH right here. You can probably imagine, right, how if you have a very acidic solution, a very low pH, and there's a ton of these positively charged particles all over the place, these can actually get in between these side chain interactions like this ionic bond over here, there's a very powerful negative charge, but if there's enough hydrogen ions around, those can neutralize that negative charge. And then this ionic bond will no longer be stable. And then the structure of the protein changes. Same with the hydroxyl ions, right? 
a bunch of negatively charged ions. Oops, supposed to be negative. Could neutralize that positive charge, leaving this negative charge nothing to interact with. Okay, so a lot of this comes down to charges. All right. We've also got the question of temperature. Remember that temperature is just a measure of kinetic molecular movement. So if this chain is being energized a lot and it wants to move around, it's wiggling and squiggling all over the dang place, right? You could see how these bonds could be physically pulled apart by increased temperature. And eventually this can disrupt all the levels of structure if the temperature gets high enough. And if you've burned yourself and seen a scar or something like that, you've seen denaturation of proteins by temperature. Also, a classic example is, you know, you cook an egg and it takes on a different, uh, the protein takes on a different conformation, right? Because you're disrupting its structure. Okay, we've also got ionic strength. That's essentially equivalent to pH. Ions, right? positive or negatively charged particles, those are going to um, disrupt the interactions between side chains, which are based around charges. Okay. Uh, they can also disrupt interactions between the backbone, those hydrogen bonds. Then we've got solubility. You can imagine this hydrophobic interaction going on right here. These would only associate if you were in an aqueous solution, a, hydro, um, a hydrophilic sort of solution or a polar solution. Because if you're floating around in a non-polar solution, there's no reason for this bond to occur because these side chains are completely soluble in the, in the solution surrounding the protein. So that's our question of solubility right there. Okay, so a protein in a nonpolar solution could be a different conformation than a protein in an entirely polar solution, for example. Cool. Protein denaturation. Oh, look, I even have a picture of an egg. Okay, cool. So denaturation of proteins by heat example egg right here it goes from being a water soluble protein to being an insoluble protein the change is is uh, significant enough to lead to that okay usually denatured proteins are easier to digest so humans have found a number of ways to denature proteins um casein which is the storage protein, the uh, amino acid storage protein, remember that we were talking about in mammal milk, right? It won't denature only with temperature. Maybe you've had a scalded milk drink. Maybe you've had, you know, steamed milk or something like that, right? However, if you adjust pH, that low pH can denature the protein, right? And you can see this curdling right here. Okay. Um, yes, fantastic. If you've ever made the mistake of putting both lemon and milk into a cup of tea, for example, then you'll notice that at a certain point you feel like you're drinking cottage cheese because the heat and the low pH have denatured the protein. It's very unpleasant. Um, in fact, I'll give you a fun story uh, that, uh, let's see, was one of my somebody on an internship with me. Their brother was a bartender and the classic trick to get people out of there who were being disruptive was um, you give them this drink that's got cream in it and Kahlua and then they have to put that in their mouth and then bite a lime. And what that does is it denatures the proteins inside of your mouth and then it swells up and you've got disgusting curdled cottage cheese in your mouth and those people hopefully leave. Um, so yeah. That's a fun little prank you can pull. Then you are probably familiar with ceviche, all right? Where proteins are chemically cooked. The proteins are denatured to increase 
digestibility. Also, this incredibly low pre uh, low pH can be effective in killing bacteria and things like this. So, you know, you put the meat in an acid, the proteins denature, they're more easily digestible. Cool. And let's see where we're sitting. Oh, it's only 12.53. We're good. We're good. We're going to have more than enough time to get through this. Okay. Next section, nucleic acids. And let's see, we've talked about our lipids. We've talked about our polysaccharides or the carbohydrates. We've talked about our uh, polypeptides and the final class of biological macromolecules that, we're, that you're all responsible for knowing something about are the nucleic acids. Okay, cool. So I'm gonna take my time with this section and hopefully make it nice and digestible for everybody. So this is another example of a true polymer. So remember, the everything except for the lipids have true easily delineated monomers that repeat themselves in a polymer. So with the nucleic nucleic acids, the building block is our, or are the building blocks are the nucleotides. <laughs> nucleotides are the monomer here. And the poly and the nucleic acid. Oops. <laughs> nucleic acid there is the polymer. And you're gonna see that in when uh, yeah, you'll see it in a couple slides here. Okay. So what is a nucleotide made up of? You have a nitrogenous base, all right? Right there. You have a sugar right here. And then you have a phosphate group right here. So in nucleic acids, we talk about a sugar phosphate backbone. And that's going to be very similar to the backbone we discussed in the polypeptides, right? Where there's a, there we go, where the backbone is entirely repetitive. So the backbone of a nucleic acid, it's just going to be phosphate group, sugar group, phosphate group, sugar group, phosphate group, sugar group, okay? Repeating. The thing that's going to be different between each nucleotide is that nitrogenous base right here. So the difference, the only difference between each nucleotide is going to be the nitrogenous base. And these are the ATCGs that you've probably seen before. All right. And then, you know, there's, there's also U, uracil is present in RNA, but we'll talk about that. Don't worry too much about that. Okay. So, this is analogous to the R group in the amino acids in that it's all the same except for the different bases. And here are all the nitrogenous bases. Cytosine, thymine, adenine, guanine, that's all in DNA. In RNA, uracil, replaces thymine, okay? Slight difference in molecular structure here. Very slight, right? They behave somewhat similarly. I used to be able to explain exactly why one occurred in RNA, but it's been so long since I took my genetics course. It's not really um, essential information. I believe they might mention it in your textbook. And if any of you find that note and would like to uh, bring it up in lecture, I would be more than happy to listen to you there. Okay, cool. Let's see. Um, come on, give, it, give the tablet a second to catch up. There we go, we're back on track. Okay, so we're gonna introduce a lot of stuff here and it'll kind of make sense why it's important later on. We've got our pyrimidines, okay? which have a single six-membered ring. And then we've got our purines, which have a six-membered ring fused to a five-membered ring. Okay, cool. Now, purines always pair with pyrimidines. And in fact, 
the pairing pattern of these things is highly controlled. So adenine always pairs with thymine. Cytosine always pairs with guanine, all right? There are two hydrogen bonds between adenine and thymine, three hydrogen bonds between cytosine and uh, guanine. And here's what I used to actually draw when I was coming into a, if I was coming into a lecture and they were going to ask me about this, I was going to do an exam, right? I would usually sketch this out at the top of my exam really quickly because it kind of has the essential information. And I had a couple mnemonic devices here, okay? So purines, pure, I associated that with egg for agriculture as like a pure application of science, if that works for you. And then A, T, C, and G, there's only one word you can actually spell with those four letters, and that is at. So once you've spelled that, you know that G has to bind with C, okay? A binds with T, therefore G must bind with C because these are complementary. There's a, it's highly specific, the complementarity between these bases. Okay, cool. And we will see this more, don't worry. You don't need to be able to identify all these. <laughs> I'm not gonna put one of these up and say like, which nitrogenous base is this? Okay, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, you might be asked if it's a purine or a pyrimidine though. Remember the purines have the double ring. Okay, now the five carbon sugar, the pentose sugar, right? Can be of two different types. So, you know, the, you know what DNA and RNA stand for? I'm assuming we've got deoxyribonucleic acid and then ribonucleic acid, okay? And these differences in names, they come from the sugar, okay? So ribose, if ribose is your sugar, it's got this extra oxygen. If deoxyribose is your sugar, it does not have that oxygen there, okay? So you might see questions like, what's the primary difference between RNA and DNA? Uh, or what's the primary difference between the sugar, ph sugar phosphate backbone and RNA and DNA? it's going to be the presence of this hydroxyl group as opposed to a hydrogen atom right there. All right, so now let's look at an actual nucleotide polymer, okay, or a nucleic acid. So once again, we've got that repeating backbone, phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar, phosphate sugar, so on and so forth. So that repeating sugar phosphate backbone. This is highlighted to show that that's a single nucleotide. Okay. And now this should make it very clear why this is more of an, a true polymer. You can clearly see the individual monomers, which are very similar to one another. Okay. Once again, assembled via dehydration synthesis. And once again, covalent bonds responsible for the bond between the monomers, okay? Turn the sugar phosphate backbone, as I already mentioned. Okay. Cool. These side chains here determine what we would call the genetic sequence. All right. And each gene is going to have a different sequence of nitrogenous bases, or you would say a different sequence of nucleotides. The only thing is, uh, but the thing is, the only portion that's actually different is the nitrogenous base. Sugar phosphate backbone is going to be consistent. Okay, now here's the complementarity of the nitrogenous bases. All right, adenine always binds to thymine, guanine always binds to cytosine. All right. Adenine and thymine are joined by two hydrogen bonds, whereas guanine and cytosine are joined by three hydrogen bonds. It's not terribly important, but it can actually lead to different degrees of stability. This bond right here is more stable, okay? So if you have a genetic sequence 
that's highly enriched for guanine and cytosine, right? then the actual double-stranded DNA molecule will be more stable than if it's highly enriched in adenine and thymine. Cool. Now this slide actually indicates something that I want to point out. It's significant that the two ringed bases pair with the single ringed bases. And that has to do, we're gonna say these are the sugar phosphate backbones with the distance, the width of a DNA molecule, okay? So DNA is double-stranded. And take a look here. We've got one ring here bound to two rings right here. Do, 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 it's good enough. Okay, now that's gonna be a specific width. If you had a single ringed, and forgive me for not getting the right number of carbons in these rings and stuff, just bear with me. Single ring structure right here, you would actually have these backbones have to be closer together in order to put them in contact to allow the hydrogen bonding, all right? Same thing if you had two double ring structures. Right? That would actually push a push the double strand molecule apart, okay? So this consistent width that results from pairing double ringed to single ring structures, that specific width is actually something that the organism can double check, okay? The organism can, can sense or de detect is the best word. It can detect when the bond is to, is resulting in compaction or expansion. That will come up later in the course. I've got a question. If, yeah, a, if an individual has more um, GC bonds in their DNA than in average in the population, does that mean that they're less likely to produce offspring with genetic differences, genetic mutations? Well, not not necessarily, not really, not really. The the mol the DNA molecule itself is more stable, but that doesn't determine the likelihood of nucleotides being switched out or mutated. It's a difficult, it's a difficult, um, the problem is probably coming from the word stability that I'm using. So this sort of stability that I'm talking about uh, right here, that would be like if you heated up the double-stranded molecule, it'd be less likely to fall apart if you had more GCs, GC bonds. Um, the sequence isn't necessarily more likely to be conserved or kept stable. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay, awesome, cool. It's a good question though. And, you know, they're always finding out new things for all I know that that could actually be a phenomenon. <laughs> Hard to keep up with the science, you know. Okay, so here's double-stranded DNA. You've definitely seen this double helix uh cartoons of this floating around or whatever whenever somebody's doing science on a tv show they've got a double helix spinning around on their monitor in the background right you've seen it all before so here we go dna is double stranded and you can only pair specific nucleic acids okay t will always bind to a g always to c right now the result of this is something very interesting, which is anti-parallel nature. Anti-parallelity, <laughs> yes. all right. Take a look here. That sequence, A, C, G, T, is repeated going in this direction, A, C, G, T. And that's actually going to be consistent throughout the entire molecule, okay? So, this strand here that I've highlighted with red is going to be identical to the other strand. It's just going to run in the opposite direction. And that ends up being actually very important. So this is me bringing it up again. Double-stranded DNA is anti-parallel, okay? 
same sequences. Right? And that's really important when we talk about DNA replication, because in DNA replication, what happens is, come on, come on, tablet. There we go. These strands are actually separated. And then that sequence, TGCA, is bound to complementary bases, like so. And this one does the same thing. Complementary bases are attached, T, G, C, A. And now look at this. These two products are identical to one another. So both of the strands need to be identical in order for DNA replication to occur. The double-stranded nature of DNA also adds to its stability. St stability, stability, my apologies. Um, RNA, for example, is just is not double-stranded, it is single-stranded and um, it is less stable, but it doesn't need, it's more of a transient molecule, it doesn't need to last as long. Right. Cool. This will also cause some other issues, right, where in order to read these DNA bases, you have to separate the double strands to access the nitrogenous bases. But we'll cover that when we talk about central dogma in more detail. Oh yes, we do have something here. Let's see, can I easily just clear my illustrations? I can't, I have to do this. Okay, there we go. So this, the importance of this will become more apparent as we move later on into the semester but we do use specific terminology to give directionality to the, um, to the strands of DNA. We call them the five prime and the three prime ends. All right, so one strands five prime end will be across from the other strands three prime end. One strands three prime end will be across from the other strands five prime end. Right. This is important for a couple of reasons. Primarily, it's because DNA synthesis has to proceed in a specific direction. All right. DNA synthesis has to proceed from five prime to three prime, meaning that the direction of DNA synthesis is going to be different on each strand, but everything's moving five prime to three prime, if that makes sense. Hopefully that makes more sense as we move forward. It has to do with the exposed hydroxyl group. All right. It's gonna be even more important when we talk about splitting up our DNA molecule for replication, five prime, three prime, okay? You have an exposed five prime, three prime, okay, like that. All these bases, come on. It's so weird, sometimes the tablet's so nice, sometimes it's just so cruel to me. Since we have to synthesize in the five prime to three prime direction, it's going to dictate which direction the complementary strand is attached, because that has to go from five prime to three prime. But I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll talk about this a lot more. This is not included in your inf information right now, okay? so. What are the differences between DNA and RNA? As I mentioned, RNA is single-stranded. It says generally here, there are specific instances where RNA can be double-stranded, but that's usually not the entire sequence of RNA. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff about this where there are things like uh, microRNA interference, where another RNA molecule like binds to a portion of the RNA, causing it to be inactivated. Lots of cool stuff where RNA can be transiently double-stranded, but usually single-stranded, okay? Next, we've got the different ribose sugar, okay? Deoxyribose in DNA, the D stands for deoxyribo, right? Ribose in RNA still has that oxygen in the hydroxyl group. Deoxyribose does not. Last difference is thymine versus uracil, okay? In RNA, uracil replaces thymine. So DNA is A, T, C, G. RNA is A, U, G, C. But the pairing is going to be the same. So you can actually modify that thing I drew before, right? Pure egg. 
TC, double bonds, triple bonds, just put in parentheses a U here. All right. And now that indicates that yes, in RNA, uracil replaces thymine. However, it's still going to, to uh, behave in the same way as thymine would. All right. Cool. Okay. Awesome. Great. Um, let's see here. What is this question asking? Okay, if you have 50% T in your DNA sequence, what is the percent uh, percentage of G? All right. So in a double-stranded DNA sequence, if you know all the percentage of T, the percentage of G will be equivalent, right? In a double-stranded sequence, because every T is going to be... Um, Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, every T is going to be offset by an A, right? And then every C is going to be offset by a G, okay? Uh, fantastic. So theoretically, in a double-stranded sequence, you would be able to say, okay, it's going to be 15% T, which means that it must be 15% A, right? The remainder is going to be C's and G's. And every C will be bound to a G, and every G will be bound to a C. So it's 70% C and G. Thirty-five percent of each. Okay. However, in a single-stranded DNA sequence you would not have enough information for this. And this question talk right here talks about melting temperature. And that relates to the stability of C to G because of its triple bonds. So yeah, higher melting temperature if you have more C and G. But if your, if your DNA is beginning to be, if your DNA is melting, then this, you have other problems. If you're hitting a temperature that's high enough to start denaturing your DNA, you got some other issues going on. A lot of your proteins are probably falling apart and you're probably not in a very happy camper. Okay, let's take a look here. We've got a strand of DNA going from five prime to three prime right here with directionality and everything. And we need to see what the complementary sequence is. So A, T, T, G, C, a, three prime, five prime. So remember, it's anti-parallel, so the five prime end will be here, and the three prime end will be here. Okay? T, uh, T, G, C, A, A, T. Okay? You write that down, and now you just need to flip it, and you'll see that B has that same sequence with the five prime to the three prime. Nothing too wild here. You'll see a lot, you'll see a few questions like this. Okay. Now, this is kind of a Why frustrating. Did you flip that? How did I flip it? I just looked why, at. Why did, oh, why did I flip it? I see. Because it's oriented right now, three prime to five prime. And I look over at my possible answers and I see, okay, it's not, it's not this, it's not this right? Those don't even have, those have, those are RNA even, right? But then, so then I look over here and I see, okay, these are oriented five prime on the left, three prime on the right. So in order to vet if that's the correct sequence, I just need to flip the thing over, you know? Cool. Awesome. Okay. This we didn't talk about very much. Uh, remember, we, but I do want to bring up the talking about radioactive isotopes. Okay. Remember that we talked about labeling with radioactive isotopes, and this is something that we'll talk about more and more in the course. Okay. So I showed you how, I only mentioned this very briefly, in the proteins, you can have these disulfide bridges that shows you that sulfur is a component of some amino acids. All right. There's no sulfur present in the structure of a nucleic acid, okay? It's all nitrogens, carbons, hydrogens, oxygens, and then a phosphate group. Okay. So 
But what this means is that if you incubate cells, if you grow cells in a medium that has radioactive sulfur, that sulfur is going to be incorporated as if it was the naturally occurring isotope. Okay. So the proteins are going to have a radioactive component in the sulfurs. Okay. And that's a very useful technique in biology of labeling, labeling molecules by feeding an organism radioactive components of that molecule. In other words, in order to build up a protein, the cells need the sulfur because the only sulfur that's available is radioactive and because it's, a radi it's an isotope, the cell just detects it as a regular sulfur element, sulfur atom, it's going to be incorporated into the protein. And then those proteins have that radioactivity. They can be detected. Okay. We talked about this already, um, that the RNA contains, or I'm sorry, the DNA contains one less oxygen atom in the sugar than the RNA does. And now we're on to the last slide. Look at that. Okay. Here's our four classes of biological macromolecules. We've got the carbs, we've got the lipids, we've got the proteins, and we got the nucleic acids. Now, see how this is monomer slash component? That's because the fatty acids behave not like monomers, okay? The monosaccharides, amino acids, and nucleotides all behave like monomers, okay? Cool. The name for the polymer or the larger molecule is over here. They are polysaccharides in carbohydrates triacylglycerols in lipids, primarily call them tri, it's not all triacylglycerols, right? Because we had some other um, types of lipids that we discussed, but we'll just use that for now. Triacylglycerol was the fat, the triglycerides, right? That had the glycerol with the three tails attached to it. That's a triacylglycerol right there. In proteins, they're called polypeptides because of a number of peptide bonds. Nucleic acids, the polymer is called a polynucleotide. Okay, there's a typo right there. Uh, and then the types of linkages here aren't really, you're not really gonna be tested on these, but it's different types of linkages in each macromolecule. Okay, cool. So that's the macromolecules PowerPoint. And really quickly, I now want to take a look at our course page because I know we've barely started the semester, but we already have things coming up. In week three, I'm going to be making exam one available. All right. So it's going to cover everything up through chapter six. It will be available all week for you. So you'll have plenty of time to do it. It's open book and it's open note. Um, fantastic. fantastic. I'm sorry, was that um, timed or not timed? It's timed, it's timed. Okay. I believe I have it set up for 90 minutes. It might be okay. 120. If you need, um, if you have, uh, what's the word? Um, accommodations for an, an additional time, please shoot me an email and I will change the settings for you. Um, Fantastic. And yeah, the exam is primarily multiple choice questions. Um, I'm going to probably adjust that for exam two. Since we have fewer students, I don't need to rely as much on multiple choice. I'll try to put some nicer uh, short and long answer questions in there. But for now, with the way the semester is kind of shaken out, um, just need to deal with just need to deal with the multiple choice for this first exam. Okay. Uh, it's a number of points, it's valuable, so don't forget. And then the week after that, we have our first lab quiz. And once again, these will both be open for an entire week. Oh yeah, see, I, I like multiple choice just fine too there, Haley. Um, yeah. 
Let's see, question in the chat there. Oh, cool, awesome. Okay, people are okay with multiple choice. I always feel guilty for not having the long essay questions, but when you have 70 to 90 students, it's nearly, a, it's just a nightmare to grade. I've made that mistake too many times. Okay, cool. That was the last little announcement I wanted to get out of the way. We have 25 minutes left in the lecture. So I'm going to now do question and answer stuff about anything, but before that, Let's all say ta-ta to anybody watching this asynchronously. Thanks for watching, everybody. See you soon in lecture. <laughs> all right, cool. And the recording ends.